page 37. We're going to finish up with today's lessons and then move in to tonight. I'm going to take you to a couple of places. But to begin with, page 37, you'll notice point B. We were talking about the problem and then the solution. <clears throat> page 37, point B, it says the 800. We've talked about this some. Uh, God gave me a plan that would allow for the gospel to be carried into virtually every country and would establish Dominion Life Churches, Dominion Life Bible, or Dominion Bible Institutes, life teams, leaders in every area of the country. We're calling this plan, this program, the 800. Amen. <clears throat> so these 800 missionaries will be trained and sent for the express purpose of going into countries and executing a specific strategic plan to accomplish all of what we just mentioned in 90 days. The whole point is not that they go there and become acclimated and have to go through all that. They're going there to do a job. They're going in there. They know they got 90 days to do it. Uh, <clears throat> they're going to do all the work ahead of time to be ready to go. And then whenever they go, uh, <clears throat> when they finish after the 90 days, within, at the end of 90 days, regardless of where they are, basically, then at that point they will come out or go to another part of the country. These 800, they're not all going, all 800 ain't going to the same place, same time. All right. We're going to divide them. Probably should have pointed that out to begin with. Uh, we're going to be dividing them into teams of four. And they'll be going into each country as four people. And out of those four, we will also be sending with them. First off, they will have graduated from DBI and from the 800 training program, which is going to be a SEAL program, which is our spirit-empowered apostolic leadership. And it's going to be going in-depth on how to function and uh, these will be people that we will literally not just disciple but it's going to be more than that I mean it's going to be some close work some intense work um, <clears throat> one of the things is that our personal goal is to be able to completely supply them with all the necessary materials and to be able to support them now, that means they'll be raising support also but the whole point is that we're trying to be able to put these people into the country where they can do the work, be there, not have to focus on anything else but getting the job done. And when they go in, they will <clears throat> communicate with either people that we already have contact with or they will go in, make contact, and when they leave, they will, well, I should even say, while they're there, they're going to make contact with the leaders. <laughs> and <clears throat> each one of the four will be able to teach all of DBI, each and every, every one of them. But since there is going to be four, then each one of the four will take three classes or three courses and will focus on those. They can do it all, but they'll focus or specialize in three of them. And that way, each one of the four all together, they will be able to do all 12 courses. Now, if they need to fill in, they can. If something comes up and they need to, to teach another course, they'll all know how to do it. But they'll work as a team. Now, <clears throat> that um, at the end of the 90 days, they will have taken with them, as they go in, uh, the DBI material, and they will be able to set up a life team and train, uh, teach the DBI to the local leaders there, raise them up, so that whenever, at the end of 90 days, they will hand over the material to the leaders, and then those leaders will go and do likewise, and it will continue to multiply. So the key, obviously, is to make sure that just what Paul told Timothy that's what these four are going to do. They're going to make sure that they are sharing what they learn with men, faithful men and women, who will be faithful to pass it on to others. So the key is that they will have to know these people, find them, uh, judge you know, whether they are able to um, do what needs to be done, and then do all of that within 90 days. Now you say, well, 90 days, that's only three months, and the Bible school is three months, and that's not allowing anything extra exactly. The point is you go in, you don't focus on anything but doing that, getting the next leaders raised up. If you need to do, uh, you know, normally we do a course in one week. If you need to do it <coughs> one or two courses in a week, then you can do that. Uh, you could actually break it up so that each of them are studying courses and working together in it because the point is not that you do a 8 to noon and then go home and rest until the next day. It would be the whole time you're there. So it would be a full time job, you might say, uh, not just eight to noon, but literally as well, you'd be going all day teaching and ministering, 
but also in the evening you'll be living with these people, fellowshipping with them, taking them out, activating them, teaching them how to do it. Now, we're saying all that, and the reason I'm bringing it in here right now during this seminar is because this is something uh, that, this is what dominion does. Okay? We are executing the plan of God. We are doing what he said to do. We're teaching, training, equipping, doing everything he said to do. And the point is that if you don't understand faith and dominion, you won't be able to do it. So you're going to have to understand how those work. Uh, let me give you uh, an example. Actually, we could, I could give you a couple of them. Um, if a person, you have someone like Wigglesworth that was um, tremendous. He's known as the apostle of faith. And he <clears throat> did many things, you know, exploits. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. And when he did it, you know, he would minister to somebody and they'd get healed, no matter how they got healed, whether he punched them or whatever it was that he did. <laughs> they got healed. And whenever he did that, people would say, oh, look, the anointing. He did that with the anointing. Somebody else would look at it and say, oh, it was a gift of healing. And somebody else would say, well, he's the apostle of faith. So that was obviously faith. Well, now, which is it? All the above. Exactly. It was every bit of that. Why? Because you can't separate them. See, life is not as uh, easily separated as a book is into chapters. Your life is what goes on in life. So, yeah, it, of course, anything you do, it's the anointing that breaks a yoke. So anytime a yoke is broken, guess what? The anointing, the, you being in the, in the position that God has put you in and, and anointed you to that position, that's what breaks that. Now you're in a position of authority, you can do it. If you're, is it uh, a gift? Well, of course, it's a gift of the Holy Ghost, and any gift he's got would be a gift. So, of course, it'd be a gift no matter what it is. And then is it faith? Well, without faith, you can't please God. And without faith, nothing's going to work anyway. I don't care how anointed you are, or, you know, powerful, or how, whatever word you want to use. I don't care how much that is in you. If you're not walking by faith, it's not going to work. Right? And so all of those things have to be present. So uh, we have so paralyzed the church by trying to figure out how things work that most of the time nothing actually happens. And so it's time to quit trying to figure out the details of how things work and just do the stuff. Amen. You know, and just get busy living the life. Because people, as you've, I know you've heard before, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. It really doesn't matter how much you know. What counts is what are you doing with it? How are you using it? Are you using it to bless God and bless people? Or are you using it as a uh, stepping stone or something to get you higher you know, publicity or greater renown or something like that? W what are you doing and why? And really it just comes down to living life and everything you do is it. You know? People say, well, you know, people ask me questions. What do you, what do, you do in your off time? <laughs> what off time? There's no such thing as off time. Right? Uh, I'm a Christian 24-7. There's no off time. Right? This isn't a job I do. Right? It's all, I mean, that, this is my life. You know? This is some of the fun part. Some of it, sometimes. You know? But a lot of times, it's just life. And it's what you do, regardless of where you are, that you're the same no matter what. That's what counts. Right? Now, so in this, we want to look. And what we're trying to do is, I'm just trying to get you to go beyond this idea of mental agreement or even just a mental understanding. Uh, a lot of people have mental understanding and can't do anything. So we've got to go beyond that mental understanding and realize this is what life is. So, <clears throat> next. Uh, talk about the 800. They'll be deployed to the target country and will take with them all necessary materials to accomplish the above stated goals. They will arrive in country and immediately make contact with a local, preferably one that has contacted us or requested uh, their presence there. <clears throat> the, uh, the 800 will operate in teams of four. Like we said, there are currently 196 countries in the world. So each team of four will go to a country. Now that, that leaves four teams left over, 16 people left over. Once everybody goes to a country, if they're there, if they all went at the same time, we'd still have 16 people left over. Those would be emergency teams that would be needed if something was going on and a team needed a help, we could send in backup more or less to send them in and help them in an area. Uh, for instance, uh, not 
well, this is a hard area and we need backup and somebody come in and help us. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they give a call and say, wow, this thing has exploded just like it's supposed to and we don't have enough people. We need help in having enough people to handle what's going on, not help make it go on. Enough people to handle what is going on. And then we send the other team in to help that. But the first team would still be the primary team. So <clears throat> this would be uh, mainly to just help them accomplish what they've already started. They'll have 90 days to accomplish their mission. At the end of the 90-day period, they'll either, well, they will turn over all ministry materials to the local leader and will either return home and await further deployment or they will relocate to another part of the country and repeat the mission. Just real simple. Isn't that simple? That's an easy plan, isn't it? Now all we got to do is come up with 800 people. That's all we need. If we had 800 people that were trained and equipped, there you go, that's one hand. Do I see another? There's another hand. There we go. There, there you go. Yeah, now, see. Well, now, now I find out what brings you alive. <laughs> okay? So, that's good. That's good. Now, they will be resupplied so as to be able to continue the mission without hindrance if they go to another area. So essentially, like I said, we'll have these 200 teams. Each person in each team will be able to teach all aspects of DBI and will be certified DHT trainers as well as certified to teach other aspects of all the JGLM and Dominion Life material. Each team member will be responsible for teaching at least three of the DBI courses, like I just said, while on each mission. So all this information is in here and you have the manual so you can go over it. <clears throat> now here's the thing. You either got to be one or send one. Remember we talked about earlier, whether you go or not is not a question. It's, it's, that's, you know, if you say you're a Christian, it's a, you might as well just be say, I'm, I'm, I'm a goer or I'm a sender, one of the two. And actually just being a sender doesn't keep you from having to go. All right? <laughs> you say, well, because a lot of people see it's real easy to sit back and write a check and not be engaged, right? But I'll tell you what, you'll sit there and write that check and go, yeah, I see it. That, yeah, they need this check. And, and I got uh, $500 I'm going to write as a check. There we go. And you sit there and you think, and you pat yourself on the back and say, well, I gave $500. So I doubt if anybody else in here gave $500, so I must be doing okay. And then you go on a trip and you'll come back and you'll say, yeah, I, I, I know I've got another 2000 put back here and I got another 500 put over here. And, and I remember I've got this thing over here I could sell. Why? Because now you're ready to sell it and get the money and put into it. Why? Because now it's not that you just, you're giving into something, something has you. you see? Well, that's why I tell everybody, I've said this from the beginning, we, we really haven't enforced it, but I think I'm about ready to now. <laughs> uh, when we started, uh, I made it actually 10 years ago when I talked about pastoring a church, and I said, if anybody's gonna be a member of the church, the first thing you have to do to be a member is uh, have a passport. Because if you're going to be a member of the church, you're going, to be, you're going to go on the field to a mission field trip some point at least once a year. Not once in your lifetime, once a year. You'll go. You say, well, but I only got two weeks vacation. Well, we'll see what you can get done in two weeks. Real simple. But then I won't have any vacation time. You don't need vacation time. You'll go out there and get totally energized, and you'll come back uh, ready to go again. Because right? that's, what, that's what happens. You know, uh, we get testimonies of miracles, we, and you see pictures on the wall and different miracles we've seen, and we've seen God do some amazing things. You know what one of the, the best memories I have of Africa now is? The township. We went to the township and went in and started just walking through there and just praying for anybody that came along, anybody that was there, just talking to them, just praying for them, and the children. And, and they're living in pieces of tin. They got tin, you know, two tin sides and a tin top and a tin back, and half of them don't even have doors. And you see these people living there, and you see these kids that have absolutely nothing. They have less than nothing. And they're out there playing, and most of them are smiling and happy right in the middle of all of it. And you go in there, and they're just glad you came because uh, you're different than them. And they just want to talk. And if you got a watch on, a ring, they'll start trying to pull all that stuff off you. They, they want to see everything, right? And I'm like, nah, leave that alone. That ain't yours, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but you get to pray for them, talk to them. And they, they'll, they'll follow you around and they want to, you know, fist bump and do their, all their little hand things and all. And you got to learn them and learn them all real quick because they're all wanting to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we were walking through there and this, uh, <clears throat> this guy came up to actually Paul Warren Gray and said, uh, you are Christians. And he said, yeah. And he said, he said what are you all doing out here? And he said, well, we're out here just praying for people. And he said, well, would you baptize my baby? And Paul came over to me and said, Curry, this guy wants us to baptize his baby, and we don't believe in infant baptism. He said, well, what, what, do I, what do I do? I said, tell him we'll do it. 
He said, really? I said, yeah, tell him we'll do it. He said, okay. <clears throat> I said, come on, because <clears throat> if it doesn't do anything, what, what can it hurt? And it's like, you know, you, you say, well, it, it didn't do any good to do it. It didn't hurt anything to do it either. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it did do some good because that man saw we cared. Right? See, I remember the story with John Lake and uh, Gandhi and some of the guys over in, uh, in South Africa when they, they, all the missionaries, were, Lake wasn't there, but all the missionaries were sitting around and Gandhi was with them. And they all started praying. And when they got to Gandhi, Gandhi was going to pray. And they stopped him and said, no, 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 you're a heathen. God won't hear your prayers. Well, if God wouldn't hear them, what would it hurt for that man to say them? Man? But instead, Gandhi got up and said, uh, I, w I wouldn't be a part of, uh, I wouldn't accept any God or worship any God that wouldn't hear the prayers of all men. And he got them left out. They had a chance to turn Handi into, uh, Handi, Gandhi into a Christian. And instead, because of their <clears throat> Pharisaic you know, idea of things, uh, he ended up not being a Christian. He ended up going back to India, did a great job in India, not, you know, not as a Christian. Imagine if he'd have went back as a Christian. Imagine what, what could have happened. All because some, you know, arrogant, uh, bigoted, let me think of other words here, they're still nice. <clears throat> um, you know, people here that um, <clears throat> just didn't want to hear him pray. And so we went over and we told him, yeah, we'll, we'll baptize your, your baby. And so we followed him back through this maze of area and get over there. And while we're standing there and he's going to get his baby and his wife and all this, getting everything ready. And these girls come out and uh, out, of the, out of one of these deals. And they, I guess they were in their, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, something like that. And just and started singing church songs. I mean, sing, I mean singing church songs. You know what I'm saying? They had, uh, what is it, break all these chains, all, all these chains, bro, something like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I've heard it, you know, but yeah, break every chain. There you go. That's it. And so they started singing that and harmony and got all this stuff going on. And they're just clapping and singing. We're waiting for the lady. And it's just a little bitty area. And this man brings his baby out. And we're standing there. We're thinking, where are we going to baptize? So he go gets a cup of water, brings us a cup of water. Well, you can't dunk a baby in a cup of water. But if we're already doing something we don't normally do, we might as well do something else we don't do and sprinkle instead of dunk. So, right? so we, just, <laughs> we just took, I took my fingers in the, in the thing and got him wet with the water they brought and just touched the baby's head and blessed the baby and blessed the family. And this man was beaming, I mean, just smiling big because his baby had been baptized and, and we explained to him about being a Christian and talked to them. And, uh, you know, we had one person in the house that, or another house that didn't, where the girls were at <clears throat> that uh, didn't want to come out, so... Well, they said, yeah, but she's sick, but she don't want to come out. They said, okay, here's what you do. Uh, you grab a hand, you grab a hand. You, and they, we made a chain of people going from the front door all the way into that lady. And they grabbed her hand and prayed for her. And we just released the power of God through every one of them to hit that lady in the house. See, if they won't come out, you go, you go get them. <laughs> Amen? And so, but that's, that's, you know, I've seen a lot of neat things in Africa. But that township, somewhere where you know you're doing good, somewhere where you know that, that the people need you. Right? I had a friend tell me not too long ago, Curry, don't go where you're tolerated, go where you're celebrated. You know? Too many times we just go where we're tolerated. And we can't just be tolerated. Amen? You gotta, you gotta, you've got to make an impact in life. Right? Not just live, but live. Amen? Amen. And, and not, not just survive. Come on. So, <clears throat> notice it says, uh, be one or sin one. As you can see, we're serious about accomplishing the Great Commission. It is obvious that not everyone can or should go. There's some people that I wouldn't want to work with on the field. Some people I wouldn't want to take with me. <clears throat> but, you know, there's other teams. Maybe they can go on another team, right? Whether you can or whether you can go or not, you're still responsible for fulfilling your portion of the Great Commission. If you cannot go or simply will not go, which is more often the case, you can send one in your stead. Jesus went and then went back home, and now he sends us in his stead. See, he still went. See, he, he went, and then went back, and now he sends us. So if you're going to go, you are at least go once. And when you get back, if you have to, send somebody else in your stead. Each life team should seriously consider sponsoring someone to be one of the 800. If one from their life team desired to become one of the 800, the life team leader should contact us and nominate the person for the next training phase that's scheduled. Why? Because this is something that's going to happen. The cost, we have no idea at this time. So it's impossible to estimate the cost of training, sending, supplying, supporting someone desiring to become one of the 800. So the idea is not about cost. The thing is, uh, one of the things also that we learned uh, from George Mueller, uh, 
Never pray for the money. Pray for the thing. Right? God doesn't have to send you money. He can get somebody to pay for it. Right? He can bring the thing to you. And so you just, you tell God, God, I don't need this. If you need a new computer, you don't tell God, I need this much money for a new computer. You tell God, I need a new computer. And he can send you the money for it, or he can get you the new computer. Usually, he'll get you one better than what you imagined, better than what you were hoping for. Why? Because he wants you to have better stuff better than you want it. Most of the time, you'll try to be humble. God, if I can just get by with this one, I'll just take this, this right here. You know, it'll last a year or so. No? And God says, I don't want it to last a year. This is eternal. Let's get a good one. Amen? Amen. So, uh, <clears throat> so it's impossible to figure it all out. But just because a person applies to become an 800 doesn't mean that they will become one. We'll do all within our power to ensure their satisfactory completion of the training. But the nature of the training will be such that if a person is unsuitable for deployment, we want to know that before we send them. Right? <clears throat> We're very picky about some of this stuff. And I know some people aren't. And in areas we haven't been in the past and, you know, we've learned some things. One thing we've learned, you send the wrong person with you on a team into a country, they can cost you that country just by how they treat the people, how they treat. It could be something as little as how they, when the people bring you food, how you look at it because they're looking at you. You're looking at the food and they're watching your face <laughs> and they may give you the best thing they've got. And if you have a look on your face, it, it could turn that whole situation around. And so... You know, if you, um, well, you, when you go in there, you have to go in as a servant. You have to go in knowing that whatever you got to do, you got to do. And you don't gripe about it. You don't complain about it. Uh, there was a scene out of Saving Private Ryan one time where that's what they were, they were talking to Tom Hanks, who was playing the lieutenant there. And everybody was griping. Everybody's complaining and walking, talking about what they don't like about the, about the Army. And finally they asked him, and said, uh, Lieutenant, what, what, what do you not like? Why don't, why don't won't you ever gripe? He says, I don't gripe down. I gripe up. See? In other words, I don't gripe to my men. I don't gripe down. I gripe up. Well, Christians need to learn that. Quit griping down to other people and start griping up to your Heavenly Father. Okay? See how far that gets you. So. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> Last time somebody did that, the earth opened up and 23,000 people died a day. <laughs> So if you're gonna, if, so if you're gonna do that, stay, stay over there. All right, don't don't come near me if you're gonna do that. <laughs> now, all right, let's turn over here to page forty. We're talking about the session seven here, and it talks about the healing service. And I just wanted to show you this because I want you to see something. See what we're talking about. Everything I've said it several times today, and it's it's we've got to. We've got to apply it to everything. This, you, know, you know how they have those uh, clear pieces of paper, like plastic, and you can write. They were called transparencies in the old day when you had to put them on the overhead projector. Remember that? Some of y'all, if you don't, you can see them in a museum, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but they had these clear plastic paper, and they'd write stuff on it and project it. Well, you ought to get one of those pieces of paper and write those three things, right? The new creation, the kingdom, sons of God. Write those on that clear piece of paper. And then every time you start to read something, just put that clear piece of paper down on it. And everything you read, read it through those three things. Right? Apply it to everything. Now, now we're going to apply it to a healing service. So what would a healing service look like? Now, first off, remember, uh, just to give you an idea, there is no recorded healing service in the book of Acts. Okay? People got healed, but there was no recorded healing service. They didn't have healing services, especially for Christians. Usually when people got healed, they got healed on the street. They got healed in front of the temple. They got healed uh, on the way, back and forth, in the marketplace. They were always healed out there somewhere. <clears throat> they weren't really healed in church services. Why? Because believers didn't get healed through a healing service. They got healed through communion. As they would partake in communion, and it wasn't about some who gave them communion. It was about the fact that they were communing with God and getting their healing directly from God because the one thing they emphasized was now that broken, that, that wall that used to be up, that partition, the veil and all that that you couldn't go through, that's been ripped open and now we have entrance into Christ. Hallelujah. And so they had that understanding. That was drilled into them that now they weren't stepchildren to God. They were God's sons and daughters. 
<coughs> and see, that's one of the things that we need to make sure. And we, we participate in communion, you know, every month. We have it usually on third or fourth week, and, uh, <clears throat> which is always good. We have it. And you can do it, you can do it every week. You know, there's some people who do it every week. That's fine. Some people do it in their home every day. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. Right? The main thing about it is if you're going to do it very often, make sure it doesn't become a ritual or just uh, you know, something that it doesn't, come, it doesn't become so common to you that it loses its, its meaning. Right? That's the key. If you can take it every day and <clears throat> keep that strong meaning, wonderful. Do it. It's great. Okay? But when you do it, recognize what you're doing it for. That bread, which represents his body, is broken for you so that you can be healed, right? So he bought your healing for that. That, that juice or whatever liquid that you're using is representative of his blood that sets you free from sin, and sin has no bondage on you anymore, no more dominion over you, and you recognize that, right? So, but all the early believers were healed during communion service. Uh, there's just a couple of other times when individuals were healed, and there's nothing that even says that they were believers, Right? They were meetings in which Paul was teaching or something was going on. Could have been a believer there, could have been a not believer, just a, a person that's in there. So we don't know. There's nothing that says either way. Now, if we're going to do a healing service <coughs> with um, <coughs> understanding dominion and applying dominion to it, if we're going to do a healing service through the eyes of the new creation, through the eyes of the kingdom, through the eyes of being sons and daughters of God, what would that healing service look like? Okay, let me ask you this before you even answer. <clears throat> what would it not look like? Okay, I can answer that one for you real easy. Any healing service you've ever seen. <laughs> All right? It wouldn't look like any of those. Why? There wouldn't be a workup of the music because it would not be psychological at all. Right? It would be uh, you simply uh, exercising dominion and simply commanding a person to be healed. That would be it. Now, in the healing services we've done, we have married these two things because we know that even in a church service, like on a Sunday or any other time, uh, <clears throat> we call it a church service, but a New Testament Christian, uh, if they were somehow transported here through time and they were in those early meetings and they come into a church service on Sunday pretty much anywhere in the world today, they would wonder where they were at because it wouldn't look like a first century church service. Right? One, because the first century church service, everybody came together, they brought food with them, they came together to, to hang out, to fellowship, to hear teaching. There was stuff going on that, you know, it was, complete, it was like family. It wasn't like school. Right? Now we have the blending of the two. And you say, why do we do that? Well, mainly because it is we would say expeditious for us, right? We generally, people don't have time or won't make time to just hang out and fellowship, especially on a Sunday. They got other things going on, different things happening, and that's one reason why we instituted the life teams. Why? Because that's the time to learn, grow, and hang out, and to fellowship, and to get to know one another. So, but uh, <clears throat> on a Sunday, and during any type of healing service or anything else, uh, People come in, they have a certain amount of time. They come sometimes from all across, especially now, they come from all over the world to visit, and they really don't have the time to just hang out. In other words, when they come, they have to get something done. Many times they come for prayer, something like that, so it has to be done. You know, um, <clears throat> I'm a, I, I, I don't, well, we just finished teaching on worship like I talked about last session, I think it was. I don't, um, I'm not a, I guess you would say, so much of a traditional worshiper. Most of my worship I get to do on my own, at home, in my car, uh, even sometimes up here. It's not always in the worship service because when on, on church days, uh, there's a lot of other things going on. And most of the time, even during the worship service, I'm getting text on my phone because they know I'm getting ready to preach. And they'll say, would you please pray for this person? Would you pray for this person? Sometimes I get phone calls because they know I'm gener generally available, which is not necessarily true because when I'm getting ready to preach, I'm not thinking about all that other stuff. All I'm saying is, God, is there anything you want to tell me now that you want me to bring out? 
And so I'm really spending time with God. That's why I go back there many times in and out. I love fellowship with the people, but at the same time, I want to know what God wants me to say to the people specifically. He gives me a message. I follow through it, but I also want to know if there's anything I've missed or if there's something he wants me to say. Because sometimes, honestly, he can show you things to come, like he says. But a lot of times, he waits to the last minute. And then he'll tell you something. Why? Because the further in advance he tells you, the more likely you are to get your head involved in it. And by the time you deliver it, it won't be anything like what he told you. Because you'll figure it all out. Rather than when you walk behind the pulpit and you're ready to start, and he tells you something all of a sudden, like, and you just spit it out. And then it's kind of like, okay, what does that got to do with anything? And then somebody will start crying and go, that was just for me. Was just for me. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you're sitting there trying to figure it out. And if you'd had time, you would have figured something out and you would have turned it and it wouldn't have touched that person. So there, that's why when I'm a lot of times in the back before a church service, I don't answer my phone. I don't even look at it because you know, I know it's going to be dinging. And usually it is going to be a prayer request, which I usually end up praying for after service because I've had people... Uh, all kinds of stuff, you know. I'm watching uh, on the internet today. Please say hi to me. My name is. And they, okay, okay. You you don't want my attention like that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, believe it or not, it's I've had people call me on the phone, and, you know, because and they don't know what time zone I'm in, and they're in another one, and they'll call me up sometimes two o'clock in the morning, and I'll answer the phone. Hello. Because usually it's an emergency if it's night like that. And is this Craig Blake? Or half the time it's even, oh my God, it is him. <laughs> yeah, yep, it's me. Uh, what can I do for you? Um, I, I didn't think you'd answer. But you called anyway. <laughs> and like, and then I have to go through the thing. It's like 30 minutes later, they finally get their question out. You know, but Where did... Where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Cain and Abel first two. Had to have wives somewhere. They multiplied. So where did he get his wife? Stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, <clears throat> just, just all kinds of questions. You wouldn't know. I had one lady that called me for months, almost every day, telling me to pray that Bigfoot would no longer come across her yard. Because he came across her yard every night. She saw him in her front yard. Bigfoot. That, that's, that's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big kind of big foot. There you go. That's a, it's, a, it's just a big foot. That's <laughs> uh, it's a, they used to call them Sasquatch or this big, like half ape gorilla looking thing that's supposed to be half man, half gorilla. It's, yeah, oh yeah, serious. And, and so, you know, I just started praying for the lady and, okay, be free, be delivered, you know. I mean, it's just amazing some of the stuff we get. And, uh, you know, I'm not making fun of it. I mean, because, you know, she was serious, too. I mean, she wouldn't just call and make a prank call. She was serious. She really thought Bigfoot was coming across her yard every, pretty much every night. And so, but those are the calls I get, uh, you know, for the last uh, 15, almost 20 years now. Uh, I've had very few nights of straight through sleep. Very, very few, right? And because we want to be available for people. And so when we come into these, that, that's why I say that back there a lot of times, is because I am, okay, God, is there anything else? What, what do you want to say? Anything, you know, that I've missed or anything else? And so when we minister in healing uh, on, a, on a Sunday or even on a Saturday night like this, we want to make sure that we're ministering not just old school healing, Right? As good as it was, I mean, people got healed, that's great, right? But we want to make sure that we're moving in the things of God, that we're moving in the flow of His Spirit. And that means, again, taking that transparent piece of uh, plastic with those three things on it and holding it over the healing service and saying, okay, how is healing like this? What is healing like this? Um, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, we've seen the dead come back already. And, uh, I know several of the people that have. Brother Hogan, he's seen it. You know, we've talked to many, many people. Many of our own people now have seen it. Uh, everything from, you know, children to very elderly. Uh, every type of disease, whatever killed them. When they come back, they're healed. Uh, we've seen all that kind of stuff. And there's, you know, people always say, well, how did you do this? And why did that work? And, and many times they may not think they're trying to get a method, but they are. 
because they're wanting to know how do I do this. And, I, and we try to emphasize it's not a method. You know, again, it's not a, an incantation or a spell that you say that makes it work. And so when we start talking to people like that and they'll say, how does this work? Well, you know, for me, uh, generally, uh, never longer than 45 minutes. You know, if it goes on more than 45 minutes, usually it doesn't happen. And so, but every time we've seen it, there was uh, several that were within literally two minutes, three minutes, something like that, maybe ten, even 10 minutes. Um, my, own, my daughter, which was the first one we saw come back, was about 45 minutes total. And so that kind of became the standard, I guess you would say. But um, the thing is, is that if we're going to look at this, I know uh, Dr. Summerall said the man came to, I, I never saw this guy, but he was up there in South, South Bend, uh, came into his church. And he said, uh, I, I've raised 12 people from the dead. And Dr. Summerall said, great, how'd you do it? And he said, uh, we go and we command the spirit of death to leave. And then we step back and hold hands and sing till they get up. That's what they did, and that's what he did every time. He, and he said, how long does it take? He said, oh, not long, just a couple of minutes. And that's what they did. They just rebuked the spirit of death and then step back, hold hands and sing. Right? Well, that's different than the experience that I've had. Right? And it's different than the experience that other people have had. So there's not a, a method. That's what I'm trying to get across. This is life and you do what's necessary. Now, if you talk to this, so let's put this over. What would a dominion application to a healing service look like? What would applying a new creation so if we're going to apply it as a new creation, and we could even say as a son of God, let's go with number one and number three. We go with the new creation, we go with the son of God. Well, the only example we got is Jesus, right? So how did Jesus raise the dead? So we're going to look at that in just a minute. But then you also have the idea of kingdom. And Jesus said the kingdom aspect is you go out, you, tell, you preach the, the kingdom of God, and then you heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils and cleanse the lepers. And he said... And when you do that, then you just tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. So the kingdom of God is intricately involved in all those things, right? It is part of the proclamation. Now, go with me to, we're going to go first to Acts. Acts chapter 9. Let's see if I can find it here. Yep, there we go. Now to see. <clears throat> Go to verse 36, Acts 9, 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. I'm sure she appreciated Tabitha much better. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, okay. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. So we know it's a good person. She did good things, right? And it came to pass in those days when she was, that, that she was sick and died whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. So now we know it's been a period of time. Right? They've already washed her, laid her in an upper chamber. So some time has gone on here. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men. So now they're that's two cities apart. And so they said, well, she's dead, so I, we heard Peter's over. You know, this all takes a little bit of time. And so they said, go get Peter. So they sent for Peter desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the win widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. And notice there, they brought all the stuff. Oh, yeah, she made this for us. So you can see, this was, again, I keep emphasizing this. There was a period of time. This person didn't just drop over, and they all gathered around and raised her up. Right? She had been through the whole process. They were starting the funeral process. They were starting, the women were starting to gather together in the upper chamber there. They had brought the coats and all the things she brought. And you know how people do. Oh, yeah, I got this gift. Yeah, she brought this for She gave this to me, made it for me with her own hands. They're all talking about it. Okay, nobody there is expecting her to, to live, right? They're all showing the things that she did. So now he says, and watch this, while she was with him. Verse 40, but Peter put them all forth. They're all standing around saying, oh, and they're all crying. Oh, and look at this, and it's sad. She was such a nice person. This isn't right. And look, at she made this for me. This is the coat she gave me. Peter comes in and says, all right, all of you, get out of here. Leave the room. You know that didn't go over too good. You know they're all thinking, well, we were here first. We're here. We're paying our respects. You need to show a little respect. 
And he didn't, he didn't show respect to them, right? Why? Because he, he was showing respect to God. And he knew if these women stay around here crying and weeping about all this stuff, and, and here I'm coming in here to raise the dead, and all they're doing is wanting to bury her. Right? Now, you can do it. Jesus raised the dead in front of everybody, big old crowd, the widow of Nain. They're carrying out her son. Everybody was gathered there, and he raised the dead right in front of everybody. Then there was another time when he put everybody out. So you see, it's not a formula. And, and honestly, you say, well, okay, well, what's the spiritual meaning behind it? Probably isn't one. You know, for some reason, we think that every action, there had to be some deep spiritual, oh, I get it. There's, that's why he did that. It could be that these women were so loud that Peter didn't want to hear them. It could be that they were whining and crying, as we know they were, and he started saying, man, if I keep listening to this, I'm not going to be able to stand in faith. They're going to get me in sympathy, and I'm going to start crying with them, and then we're going to bury Dorcas instead of raising her. So you have to figure out where, what can you work in. Now, the best thing is to be able to work in the middle of everything. Be able to work in the middle of the storm, whatever's going on, you ought to be able to stay focused, and that's the best thing. Right? One of our uh, <clears throat> leaders uh, in Australia, Adam, uh, the way he trains some of the, the workers there is he'll have them preaching and then he'll go around behind and he'll take water bottles and, and he'll start s squeezing them and, you know, when they make the noise and all that kind of stuff. Or he'll take a metal chair and just knock it over and have all kinds of noise going on and just say things, start talking right while they're preaching. Why? Because he's trying to get them used to interruptions because while you're preaching, everything under the sun will happen. Why? To get your attention off. To get you to lose your train of thought. Oh, uh, uh, okay, uh, and, and it'll happen. See, the enemy will make it up. You'll be preaching and all the lights will go out. Well, what are you going to do? Stop preaching? Why would you stop preaching because the lights are out? See, the only reason you do that is if you don't know what you're saying and you've got to read it. Right? But if it's in you, that's not the time to stop preaching. That's the time to keep preaching. Why? Nobody should move. Everybody should stay put. And if you stop and everybody's going to start moving around, somebody's going to end up bumping into somebody or... Anything else? We had one time I was preaching and had to tell them uh, we were doing the, um, no, it wasn't a DHT, it was just a regular service. And I called one of the deacons up because while, the, while I was preaching, I noticed this man kept moving across, sitting in the chairs. And he would move from one chair to the next. One, and he'd move the chair and then he'd duck out of sight. And he'd come back up, move over a couple of chairs and duck out of sight. And it just his head bobbing up and down. I'm watching him. And so... I'm, I'm just, I'm still preaching, still going on, but you know, your mind starts to think, what, what is he doing? You know, and he would kind of sit back up and, and he'd go back down again. And I'm thinking, but I'm still preaching and I can't stop and just watch him, you know, because then everybody else is going to start watching him. And, and so I'm looking and then I realized what he's doing. Uh, the women had their purses on the ground. He was going through the purses. He was getting their wallets out of their purses. And I had to call the, the elder up and I told him, and, and when he comes there, I just turn my microphone off and said, go. Uh, stand by the door and catch this guy because he's, he's going through their purses. So he went and got security and pretty soon they grabbed him and took him out. Right? You'd be surprised what goes on while you're preaching. Right? And so that's why we tell women, women if you're going to put your purse on the ground, put it in front of you, not under the chair. Right? Just smart things. Right? Things you don't think you'd have to think about in church. But you do. Right? There you go. <laughs> and all the people behind him like... <laughs> I didn't touch it, honest. <laughs> so there's, he would make all this noise because he wants to distract people so that whenever they're preaching, they get used to that. I was preaching in um, Bentonville, Arkansas one time. A big storm came up. I probably told you about it. But uh, the storm came up, and I was preaching, and all the lights went out. It was in a Best Western Hotel meeting room. Everybody, as soon as the lights go out, everybody starts. These people hadn't made a, kind of like y'all, hadn't made a sound all day. <laughs> Not just like you, kind of. And had made a sound all day. And then as soon as the lights goes out, everybody starts yelling. Oh. Everybody's hollering, oh, ah, ah. And so it was like, I had to get loud. And I said, because my PA system went off. And I said, everybody stay put. Don't move. Now's not the time to move. Just stay seated. It'll be okay. They probably have generators that are going to kick on. They didn't, but it was okay. <laughs> and so I, just, I said, I'm not done yet. I'm still preaching. And so I went over and stood Actually, by the exit sign once where I could see one passage I was trying to read from the Old Testament. And I went back and I got back up at the front. And I just started walking around because I could, I, you're, you're, you know, you adjust and you can see a little bit. And so I just started walking around and I was still preaching. But if I had to read my notes, then I couldn't have done that. Why? It's not about the notes. It's what you got in you. 
See, I don't sit around my house and, and 30 minutes before I go preach or grab my Bible and say, okay, what, what should I preach? I live in this, right? Yeah. And, and, and if I take a break, it's to get up and walk around a bit, and then I come back and, I, and then I'm reading again, I'm studying again, I'm thinking again, right? Yeah. And my wife sees me thinking, and she thinks I'm not working. <laughs> and I, I told her, I said, no. She goes, she goes what are you doing? Oh, good, you're not doing anything. Mm, yes, I am. She goes, what are you doing? I'm thinking. <laughs> she said, you're always thinking. And I'm like, yes, I am. And she goes, well, then think over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, and I, I, but I kept preaching until that light came back on. It came back on. We finished up the healing service and went right on. You, you've got to get to where nothing bothers you, right? Nothing interferes with you. Uh, in here, you know, we record all these, so everybody wants it quiet. And that means, you know, generally no children, no crying. And children don't bother me. They bother you because they're closer to you. So you can't always hear me speak. So you're trying to hear and I understand that. But they don't bother me. And so when I go overseas and kids there, it's great. I found the um, pictures the other day when I was in Africa the first time and had the church where I, while I was preaching, the ma- it has the pictures of the man standing there with a microphone and a little cassette tape deck. And he's standing there and, and he, he, I get up there to preach and he holds the microphone for me. And he's just holding it there. And he goes, wait, click. And it starts recording on a cassette, right? And he holds a microphone. And I'm kind of looking at it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to preach. <laughs> you know, because this isn't normal. And so he's just standing there the whole time, holding the microphone, holding the cassette. But, and I'm preaching, and I'm going. And then all of a sudden it starts going, you know, if you remember the old cassettes, click. And that means it got to the end and then stop. And he's like, I stop. And I'm like, he opened it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm watching all this. I'm, I'm watching him go. And, I'm, and he points back at me, and I'm going, oh, where was that? What, what, what was I talking about? You know, just, just, so you have to learn not to get distracted. And then while I'm preaching, at one point, these kids, it's the funniest, first off, these kids, uh, the, these goats, come running through the church, literally, <laughs> from one door to the other, just run to the church, and it's the goats. And I'm standing there preaching, the guy's holding the microphone, and all of a sudden the goats come running through, and I'm like, and I'm watching them, and they just run through. And like, not even 10 seconds after, all these little children run through chasing the goats. <laughs> and I'm watching them go through, and I have to go back to preach. And I start preaching, and a few minutes later, now all of a sudden, the kids come running through, and the goats are chasing the kids. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's just going back and forth on <laughs> But it's great, you know, and, and it, well, but you, you've got to get to where nothing bothers you, right? And, and over here, it's different over there, you know, anywhere you are pretty much is different. And, but you have to learn to let things not get to you. And so you just keep focused and you keep preaching, you keep going on whatever needs to come out. And sometimes you'll be going a certain area and God on purpose will say, I know you're going this way, uh, but I didn't, I didn't tell you to go that way. This is something you did. And now I want you to go this way. And you'll keep trying to go back to here, and he'll keep pulling you off over here. And you keep trying to go back, and you keep pulling. And pretty soon you can tell. So hopefully you just go, okay, fine. We're just going to do what God wants us to. Right? Uh, when I was in Australia once, I was in, um, where was that? Melbourne? Outside of Melbourne, I guess it was. Seems like it was. Yeah. And uh, near, I guess it might have been Doncaster. might have been Doncaster when I was there. Um, and I was, <laughs> I remember I was supposed to teach the uh, SWAT training. And we had the SWAT manuals. We were ready to go. I started that morning, went out there, opened the manual, started, I read like two verses, boom, took off on something totally different and didn't get back onto it to the, for the whole 45 minutes. And then went to take a break. And the guy, the host there came back and said, Curry, what's going on? This isn't SWAT. And I'm like, I know, I know it's not. It's, you know, I kept trying to get back over there, but God took me here. So, you know, he goes, and he was upset. He said, the people came for SWAT. You need to give them SWAT. They bought SWAT manuals. I don't know where you're teaching from, but that ain't it. So you need to teach SWAT. And I'm like, I'm trying. I'm trying, you know. But God's going this way. And he goes, I don't care. Teach SWAT. And I'm like, I'm trying. I really am. And so finally, I go back out there. I did again. Second session, exactly the same thing. I mean, I'm like, I'm focusing. I don't want to see nothing. I don't want to look at anybody. I'm just right here. I'm like, okay, here, here. I start. I get like two things. And then I said, and then this, and then I'm gone. I'm taking off on that same thing again. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So I take a break again. 
He comes back there, Curry, people are getting mad. I said, well, how do you know? I said, have you asked him? He said, no, but, but you know, they came for SWAT. And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking at them. They don't look mad. <laughs> you know? And I said, I, I don't know what's going on. I said, listen, I've got a choice. I either follow the manual or follow God. I said, I'm going with God. I said, that's what I'm going to do. Amen. And he said, well, people don't like it. And, and there was a bunch of other things involved. And I think they're, well, actually what it was, too, is there were people that were there that uh, weren't there because they liked me. And, and so I, apparently I was hitting some of the things that were their pet doctrines. And so I, I told him, I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. He goes, well, we've got to do SWAT. You've got to go back and do SWAT. I'm like, I'm doing the best I can. So I said, I'll tell you what, we'll go back. So I went back out there and I told the people, I said, listen, y'all have seen what's going on. Y'all see, I start in SWAT. I start. And then it takes off every time. I said, that's not me. I'm trying to stick with it. But apparently the Holy Ghost is doing something. I said, now I'm going to ask y'all, what do y'all want me to do? You want me to stick with the manual or you want to follow the Holy Ghost? I said, how many of you want me to follow the Holy Ghost? Every hand in the place just about went up, except the people I was blasting. They didn't. Yeah. I think they wanted me to stick with the manual. But, um, okay. but they were, and I said, all right, then by your own decision, I'm going to follow God. And they all agreed. And so then the guy that was, had been talking to me got real upset and sat down and shut up and didn't bother me again. And so then I just said, here's what we do. And I started warning them about some things that had been going on here in the States and I told him, I said, it's coming. And it's coming to your shores and it's coming soon. And I'm warning you ahead of time. When it comes, you don't fall prey to it. You stay away from it and don't do it. And literally, within about three months, we started getting reports where that doctrine had started trying to get in there. And because of what I had said that day, there were whole churches that had said, we do not accept this. And they stood strong. And the other churches that did accept it are now, right now, there's four of them that I know of that are all split and closed because they accepted that doctrine, right? It pays to follow the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Acts chapter 9, verse 36, we'd read through how Peter raised the dead here. And it said here, now watch, it says, uh, then Peter, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him, or turning to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. Isn't it funny? At first he talks about the widows. It was all the widows that were doing the crying. And then whenever he calls everybody, he calls the saints and the widows. He doesn't even include the widows and the saints. I'm assuming they made an impression on him. Okay, so anyway. <clears throat> so, but now notice it says, and he gave her his hand and presented her alive, and it was known throughout all Yapa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Yapa with one Simon a tanner. Now, notice here though, notice the situation. He went in, put everybody out, kneeled down, and prayed. Now, and then it said, and turning him to the body. So when he knelt down and prayed, he wasn't facing the body. But when he turned, he turned to the body. And look what he said. He didn't say, now he'd already been praying. And then he turned and said, Tabitha, arise. Isn't it funny? He didn't call her Dorcas. Everybody else called her Dorcas. He called her Tabitha. Right? Now, you say, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know everything. I'm just telling you. <laughs> I just... To be honest with you, I've never seen that before. It was just now. So I'm just, I'm just okay. <laughs> so, but I would assume, okay, that Tabitha was her real name. And that she was called Dorcas, which was a nickname, right? But Tabitha would be her real name, and that's what she would be called. When he called her, he wanted to call her a real name, not her nickname. Right? Now, if you now notice what he did though. When he commanded her to, to arise, he didn't He'd already prayed. It doesn't say what he prayed. So what does that mean? It's not important. Because if it had been important, they would have told us. Right? But he prayed, and then he turned, and when he spoke to her, he didn't, he didn't pray to God speaking to her, oh God, please raise her. Right? Now, I'm, I, I, again, I'm guessing, you know, I, I can't say this is what he said while he was praying, because it doesn't say. But my understanding of things now and how, what I've seen happen, my guesstimate would be that when he knelt down and started praying, he was pushing all that other stuff out of his head 
And he was telling God, exactly, God, you sent me here. God, your son said for me to raise the dead. Your son told me that, and that's what I'm going to do. And so right now, I thank you, and I think he was thanking him ahead of time for what was fixing to happen, right? And then he turned back to her, and then he said, Tabitha, arise. Now, notice, that is a command. He didn't pray. He didn't beg. He didn't ask. He commanded Tabitha. He said, Tabitha, arise, right? Now, go with me to Matthew chapter 9. And here we go. See if I can find it. Yeah. Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. This is whenever the ruler of the synagogue came to him and said, My daughter, even now, lies at the point of death. If you come and lay your hands on her, she will live. Verse 23 says, and then, of course, while he's going, the woman with the issue of blood come up to him and uh, touches his garment and kind of stops everything. And it's in the middle of it. Then he gets her healed and turns around in verse 23 says, and when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. So what does that mean? The funeral's already going. So there had been some time since she died. You got that? So all of these are not while the body's still warm. Okay? So, and they saw the minstrels and the people making a noise. And he said to them, give place for the maid is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth. See, I love those two verses. I don't know why they made them different. They should have connected those together. They laughed him to scorn and he put them out. What does that say? Laugh at me, will you? I'll put you out of here. And that's why. Because he was in charge. Amen? I mean, think about that. That's what he's doing. And don't you see that? They laugh at him and the next thing he says, and he put them forth. So what does that tell you? When somebody comes to raise the dead, don't laugh. Right? You laugh, you get put out. You won't get to see the dead raised. Right? And then they'll be talking about it, and they'll say, where were you? Well, I didn't see it. Why not? Well, he put me out. <laughs> made, made me leave the room, right? No, that's not what you want to be, right? So, you notice, and they, but when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. Now, that doesn't say he said anything here, right? Other times, he spoke to him and said, I, I send thee arise, um, daughter arise. I mean, it, over and over again. Every time, here's what I'm getting, here's what I want to get across. When, and and we've, we brought this forth in the DHT, and I'm pushing it now because you have to see where this is going. When we minister, whenever Jesus ministered healing, and when we teach the DHT, we show you that when Jesus ministered, he ministered by authority and dominion. He exercised dominion, right? Healing was warfare, and he was exercising the dominion of God. That's what I want to get across to you. It's not about begging God to do it. If you're going to pray, then pray. When I minister to people uh, out in public, especially, many times, first, I will pray. And I pray to God. And why do I do that? I don't have to. I only do it so the people will hear me praying to God so they'll know who I'm connected to. Right? That's the only reason. And there comes a point when I stop praying to God and I turn my attention to them and to their sickness and then I speak and I command their sickness or disease to go, right? But that's two separate events. One is praying to God, and usually what I do, I will say something along the lines of, Father, I thank you that right now in the name of Jesus, you allow me to enforce the victory that your son Jesus has provided. Amen. And that's, that's about it. And then I, then I say, in Jesus' name, I thank you for it. And then I turn to people and I say, all right, in Jesus' name, right? Now, that way it satisfies their idea that I have to pray. And yet, at the same time, it shows who I'm connected to. And it allows me to detach from that and to attach to them and to issue command and dominion. So if we're going to have a healing service by dominion, it's not going to be a bunch of begging. It's not going to be working people up with music to get them up because healing is not psychological. Right? <coughs> healing is spiritual or it's nothing. If it's psychological, then it's going to be psychosomatic and the symptoms are going to return shortly as soon as you get back down to normal. So we go the opposite direction. We go out of our way not to work people up, right? Now, that doesn't mean I go out of my way to put people to sleep either, even though that does happen at times, right? <laughs> but we're not trying to work people up, amen? We just want to, we want it to be real. And whatever we do in here, we should be able to do anywhere else. So, <clears throat> all right, go with me one more place to Mark chapter 5. 
Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> and let me see here. Not that one. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> In Mark 5, verse... Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Start at verse 35. While he yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he says to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. So you've got to get this picture. <clears throat> he, the ruler of the synagogue said, Listen, you've got to come, my daughter's... And the first thing, as soon as he starts to do that, somebody comes up and says, Don't bother me anymore. Uh, your daughter's dead. It's too late. She's already died. Before the man can say anything, Jesus turns to him and says, Don't be afraid. Only believe. In other words, don't say a word. Right? Let's just... just let's go. Let's do this. Don't, only believe. Okay? <clears throat> then he said, <clears throat> where are we at here? Yeah. <clears throat> verse 36. Uh, yeah, verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he comes to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and sees the tumult. Okay. And them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he says unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, well, there we go again. Okay. <laughs> he takes the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entering, entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kume, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Now notice he is specifically telling her, you get up, you arise. Again, it's a command you never find a place where he is praying, begging, or asking. He is in dominion, and he is commanding. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was at the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with great astonishment, and he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Right? Now, why did he say, give her something to eat? Well, we know now, whenever you give someone something to eat, Right after they come back from the dead, it causes all the systems because of the uh, digestive system to kick in and causes their spirit to stay there. When someone dies, their spirit leaves. The, the body without the spirit is dead, so their spirit leaves. So whenever you call them back, as soon as it is any sign of life, one of the best things to do is give them something, some small thing to eat. Because once you do, that starts the digestive system, which starts all the systems of the body and makes the, the spirit or the body able to hold on to the spirit so that they stay alive and don't die again. We've actually heard cases where people didn't do that and the, people, the person came back and then died again. Right? Why? Because the rest of their body didn't come back on. They sh now, I'm not saying it's because they didn't feed them. I'm just saying that the times that we know of, it has happened before. Right? And so it's good if you can give them something to eat. I'm not talking about going and cooking a five-course meal. Right? <laughs> I'm talking about just a piece of bread. <laughs> something. Something small. Okay? Now, so I just wanted you to see, every time Jesus raised the dead or anybody else raised... Now, I, I do want to point this out. <clears throat> In Acts 9, we started in Acts 9, then we went to Matthew 9, then we went to, to Mark 5. In Acts 9, what did Peter do? He goes in, puts everybody out. Right? He goes in there. And then he turns to her and he commands her to arise, right? Where did he learn that? Jesus. Straight from Jesus. All he was doing is what he saw his master do, right? He wasn't getting specific direction. God didn't tell him what to do. He just did what he saw Jesus do. Why? Because Jesus said, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. Will this fit that situation? This is the situation that you're in, right? So we need to command, not beg, but to command. What is, if you, the minute you start begging and crying or weeping or doing something else, you have left the realm of dominion. You got that? And remember from the very beginning, what we said first thing this morning, Genesis 126 to 28, let them have dominion. Let man have dominion. This is who we are. It's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Jesus has returned us to that and made it now where nothing shall by any means hurt us. So we have dominion over every situation of the devil to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the devil. Amen? 
So that's why I said this whole thing. There were parts of it that might not have sounded like we were talking about dominion, but we have to realize dominion has to take place in every part of our life, in every area of our life, but also in every part of your life, meaning your spirit, your soul, and your body. You need dominion in all three areas. You need dominion in your will. You need dominion in every aspect of your soul, of your emotion. You need to have control of your emotions. I don't mean be emotionless, but you have to have control of your emotions. Uh, during the worship uh, teaching that we did, we made it the emphasis that you should be able to worship God's spirit, soul, and body, right? Not saying you have to do it all the time the same way. Not saying every time you have to jump up and down and run and shout. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to be able to do that, right? There's a difference in, in doing it and being able to do it, right? If you can't do it, you're in bondage and you need freedom to be able to worship God with your total being. And so that's the same thing. You need to have dominion in your total being, in your spirit, your soul, and your body. And in, there's different point, uh, parts of each one. We'll talk about those here in the near future. And we'll be talking about the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, the intellect, all these areas we'll be talking about. When we talk about, we'll be talking about the will. And you have dominion in every area of this. Your will is the big area that we'll be talking about. That's, that's a... a Everything comes back to that, right? Because you can sit there all day long and say, I'm going to get up. I want to get up. I need to get up. I'm going to get up. I'm getting up. And you can keep saying that, but until you engage your will, you will not get up, right? So there has to, and it's something, it's one thing to say it. It's one thing to want to do it. It's one thing to even think about doing it, but you have to engage your will for it to happen. And until you engage your will, it will not happen. And that means that you have to have dominion over your will in every area because otherwise you won't witness. You won't pray for the sick in public. You won't do these things until your will is engaged and your will won't be engaged until you have dominion over your own will. Yes. Yeah? You have to speak to yourself and command your will to line up. I will serve God. I will not do that. I will do this. Right? And you develop a strong will and use it for God. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, not my will, but your will. Amen. Right? And so you have to say, will, we're going to follow God's will. Amen. That's what we're going to do. So that means, will, we're going to do this. Even if I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it. So therefore, my will is in it, even if my soul is not in it. Right? And then when you do it because you will to do it, you still get, that's still a virtue, even if your mind is not wanting to, right? We'll talk about all that. Anyway, sorry, going on. So, what would a true dominion life manifested sons of God healing service look like? Well, it'd be dominion. It would be command. It would not be weak. Now, we are living in the blessings, meaning that we have the blessing of dominion. We have this authority and we can live in it and we can actually process this in a way where we are living through the blessing. And when you do that, it comes to the next one, point C, of being the blessing. Right? If you have blessings, it's not for you to be blessed. It's so that you can be a blessing. And you, have to, and you have to realize that the minute you start thinking about being blessed instead of being the blessing, then you shut the door for blessings to come into your life. Right? And all, you've, all you're going to get is what you've already got. So... John Lake said, the secret of the Christian life is not in the becoming, but in the being. That's the, that's the big deal. At some point, make the decision of your will to quit trying to become. Make that step over and decide, today I am who I was meant to be. And then start acting like it's true. When you do that, you'll see the biggest change in your life overall. Amen? Amen. All right. In the rest of the manual, we're not going to go through the other... I don't know, 20, 30, 40 pages, whatever it is. There's a bunch of information in here. We always include all those prophetic words at the end. You should read them, go through them. Most of them are being fulfilled right now. And, and we've actually started seeing many of them being fulfilled very quickly. But uh, you should read through those because if you're, especially if you're in DBI or you're part of JGLM at all, this affects you. It's part of your DNA. It's part of your destiny. Amen? So read them and realize what they are and what God has for you.